let me begin with a side note that just might be the most important takeaway from this sermon. In our first reading, you may have heard the name of Ruth's sister-in-law, Orpah. Well, in rural Mississippi in 1954, this biblical name Orpah was given by her aunt Ida to Orpah Gail Winfrey. That's right, Orpah Winfrey. It's on her birth certificate. But because her family had trouble spelling and pronouncing the name, in fact, I think our lector said Oprah, uh, they called her Oprah from infancy, and the name stuck. Never say you don't learn anything useful in church. <laughs> this week and next week are the only times we hear from the book of Ruth in our three-year Episcopal lectionary cycle. And because next week we will use the readings from All Saints Day and so won't hear from Ruth again until 2024, I thought we'd spend a little time with this story today. Naomi and Elimelech are married and live in Bethlehem with their two sons, Malin and Chilion. Famine strikes, famine strikes, and they are forced to migrate to Moab to survive. Now for the people of Israel in the Bible, Moab, as scholar Robert Alter puts it, is an extreme negative case of a foreign people a perennial enemy. The Torah actually bans any sort of intercourse, social, cultic, or sexual with the Moabites. So it's a big deal that this is where they're forced to go. And it's an even bigger deal when after their father Elimelech dies, Malin and Chilion marry Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth. But perhaps the biggest deal of all is that the writer of the book of Ruth depicts these two Moabite wives as admirable, loyal, and loving. Okay, historic side note. Try to stay with me. This is tricky. The story of Ruth takes place in the days when the judges ruled, as it says in verse 1. And as you would hear next week if we were reading it, Ruth turns out to be the great-grandmother of King David. So we're talking the year 1200 BC, give or take a century. That's when the story takes place. Think of the order of the Bible books that also happens to be the title of a Lyle Lovett album, Joshua Judges Ruth, way long ago. However, most biblical scholars would agree that the book of Ruth was actually written in the year 400 BC, give or take a century. Now here's why that's important. After the Israelites returned from exile in Babylon beginning in 539 BC and the temple at Jerusalem was rebuilt and the city of Jerusalem was refortified, both Ezra the priest in that time and Nehemiah the civic leader were very hardcore about forbidding intermarriage between those returning Israelites from exile and the people who had moved into Jerusalem and Judah in their absence who now inhabited the region, including Samaritans. This edict against intermarriage was in part a way to maintain their cultural identity once they were reunited with their land and to keep their monotheistic worship. But it was so severe a restriction that, as Robert Alter notes, Israelite men who had long-standing foreign wives were forced to expel them with their children. It was pretty bad. Within that intense milieu of tribalism, somebody wrote the book of Ruth. A book where Israelites are the foreigners in Moab. Their sons intermarry with the locals, the sons die, and their Moabite wives remain loyal and loving to their Israelite mother-in-law Naomi and even want to accompany her back to her land of Judah. When they do return to Judah, Ruth the Moabite marries Boaz the Israelite, and they prosper. So whether this book of Ruth was deliberately written in its time to counteract the exclusionary times of Ezra and Nehemiah, I don't know. But it is certainly a more inclusive, embracing vision of relationships, showing that love and all its diversity is still love. And of course, it says something that a Moabite woman, Ruth, 
becomes the great-grandmother of David, who is arguably history's Israelite numero uno. End of historical side note. Love your neighbor as yourself. It is no accident that Ruth is paired with this passage from Mark's gospel. Jesus says this commandment is second only to loving God with all your might and all your being. And they are in fact related. Remember that when this same story where the question is asked is told in Luke, the follow-up question is, well, then who is my neighbor? Which leads to the story of the good Samaritan. Ah, more Samaritans. I hope you're seeing a pattern here. Samaritans were not the other. God insists on inclusion, even as the world continues in its addictive pattern of marginalizing. Near the end of today's gospel reading, the scribe who asked Jesus the question, which commandment is first of all, commends him for his answer. You're right, Jesus, he says. To love God and to love your neighbor is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. In other words, love is more important than religion. Not faith, but religious practice. If I love being an Episcopalian, coming to church and saying the prayers, and I do not have love in my heart for my neighbor, I am breaking at least the second greatest commandment. Religion is either a means through which we learn to be better people and to love more, or it is just a bunch of hand motions. Jesus says to the man, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Ruth left her country and gods to be with Naomi. Her love for her mother-in-law and her commitment to family bonds was that great. Love your neighbor as yourself. Apparently here in Los Gatos, some of our neighbors are rabid anti-gay conspiracists who disrupt town council meetings and harass our mayor outside her home. All because the council has made some tentative first steps towards embracing diversity. You may have heard about this on the news. How do you love people like that? Well, for starters, by not hating them. Now, I admit I have played out all kinds of scenarios in my head about what I would do if they stormed into our church with its gay rector and disrupted our worship. One of the more vivid fantasies I've had involves taking up one of these large pavement candles up here and running down the aisle swinging it at them. Never mind that I can barely lift one of these. But then I realize that this might set a bad example for the rest of you. So I've considered less violent strategies like calling 911 or having Colin, our organist, strike up a series of loud hymns that we can sing together to drown them out. And I remember that somewhere else, Jesus says, love your enemies. I will try to do that. But I would argue that to love bullies means not to concede to their harassment. Almost like you love them by standing up to them, while not engaging in the same tactics of rage they use. The mayor is our neighbor too, as are many LGBTQ Los Gatons. And I see an echo of that Ezra, Nehemiah exclusion and tribalism in these people who would have anyone who is not like them expelled. I choose the way of Ruth, of connection and loyalty to what is good, even when I might prefer something more ruthless in my thoughts. It's scary to stand up to bullies, but whenever they have won throughout history, bad things happened. And so maybe like Ruth, we are called to sacrifice a life of comfort in our own land for a greater good in a new land. We won't be moving somewhere else, but we can make this place, this town, better, different, loving, safe. We can, for example, choose to march in that November 14th United Against Hate walk with our neighbors in solidarity against bullying and intolerance. And I honestly do not see this as a conservative versus liberal question. I see it as a hate versus love question, a fear versus courage question. 
A question of expulsion versus welcome. And the question for us all is, will you love your neighbor as yourself? Will you remain loyal to that love and stand up for it? Some of us may choose the path of Orpah and stay in a place that is easier for us, letting others commit to doing the scary thing and taking that journey. I don't think we're meant to condemn Orpah's decision. It was understandable. In fact, she was doing exactly what Naomi asked her to do. Stay here in Moab. Find a new husband among your people. Prosper where you are and don't risk losing it all by clinging to me. But Ruth chooses the better portion. Where you go, I will go. We are in this together, she says, and I'm not going to leave you alone to face the future on your own. That's the message we are called as Christians to give to our neighbors who are being shouted at and hated. So we give thanks for Ruth this day, for her example of love in a time of exclusion, of faith despite the temptations of an easier life. May our choices bring new life to this world, to this town, even as hers did. Amen.